I want to welcome our next guest. This gentleman, his name is Cherie Rode. Look him up. He's currently a major sales leader in the cybersecurity industry at a company called Threat Metrics based in the Silicon Valley area. That company was acquired by LexisNexis in 2018 for $1 billion. He began his sales career at a company called Newstar, which is a publicly traded internet services company back in 2013. And before that, he was an investment banker on Wall Street. Raised in the heart of the Bay Area in California, he received his undergraduate degree from John Hopkins University and his MBA from the University of Virginia. And in his free time, loves to stay fit, working out. We just talked about it and spend time with his family and very importantly, learning new skills to advance his sales career. So with that, I want to introduce Mr. Sheree Rode. Sheree, how hey. are you? I'm doing well, Jeremy. How are you? You know, I'm just hanging out. We're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in our free time right now, but I wanted to welcome you to the show. You know, I've been wanting to have you on here for a while. I've known about your success. I've, I've known about it because, you know, I've done a lot of training with you as well. So it's a pleasure to actually have you on the show. So what I want to do this, let's go into some background on how you got started. Like, how did you get started in sales? And how did you go from where you were at then to where you are now? Because you are making mm -hmm. a lot of money as a W-2 salesperson. I got started in sales in 2013. Before that, I was an investment banker uh, for about 10 years. I worked for these major firms that everyone's probably heard of, you know, Bear Stearns, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America. And as an analyst and associate, as an investment banker, it's not fun, right? You know, you're working like 60, 70, 80, 90 hours a week. You're working... Seven days a week, no vacations. You got to work during the holidays. Right. And what I realized is that I wasn't getting the type of exposure I wanted from a client facing kind of way. Right. Okay. When you're at the bottom of the totem pole and working for VPs and managing directors, you know, they give you an Excel file. You do all the work. They get to present your work. And, you know, if it's something they want to move forward with, yeah, you could get closer to closing the deal. If it's not something that they want to move forward with, you know, you kind of get brushed off and you get a new project to work for, right? Sure. So I never really got to finish the success that I started. I didn't know I wanted to do sales until I was like in my late 30s, right? You know, a lot of my colleagues, I bet you a lot of your listeners, they've been doing sales for 20, 30 years. Started off like selling cell phones door to door when they were teenagers and so sure. forth. But for me, I didn't know that sales was kind of what I wanted to do, what my passion was. But I did know two things. I loved to solve problems. I loved to converse with people who have problems, to understand if they have a problem to begin with. And I loved to hustle. Right. I mean, it's, I found it just exhilarating. And I'm not talking about the cold calls, but I'm talking about like going after the unknown. Right. right? And so when you, when you, when you cold call someone and you're like, Hey, you know, this is so-and-so and blah, blah, blah. You don't, a lot of people are scared of cold calling. Right. Yeah. I loved that part of the business because it, I found it exhilarating. And when I succeeded, I found it rewarding. The only kind of career I thought about was that I was going to fit that kind of those passions of mine was sales. And I saw I built straight in in 2013 at the very bottom. Yeah. And I stayed in the industry ever since. So I went from a $120,000 salary yeah. coming out of MBA school from a top school, started all the way at the bottom as an account executive making 64,000 bucks. Yeah. So your income went in half. And let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. So I want to go, uh, I'm going to ask you some questions today that I know is really going to help our listeners with their sales process. Like what can they apply in sales, what they sell today that you are doing today to get them to the next level? You're in the trenches, right. they're in the trenches. Here's what I'm doing. So the industry that you're in, cybersecurity, right? Mm -hmm. What do you sell specifically just so people know? Um, so it enables any business that has kind of a web facing channel. Like, so virtually that's almost every business today, right? You know, the retails, the banks, so forth to know that whomever is coming onto their site to either open a new account, request a loan, get a credit card, make a payment. It is that person who they say they are, right? So right. it's not right. impersonating to be Jeremy minor with the sure. information and social security. So We've assembled some type of algorithm that actually lets these companies know that it is Jeremy Miner or it is Sri Rode that is executing that transaction and buying the shoes or the TV on Walmart 
Yeah, so you're saving companies probably millions of dollars a year, these banks, so they're not having fraudulent transactions, basically. Absolutely, yep. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your success in terms of like, you know, awards you've been winning, income you've been making. I mean, I know what your income was this last year. Congratulations, by the way. But tell us a little bit more about that. When I first started my career at, in 2013, all the way to 2017, I didn't win one award, nothing. I, I didn't even make it to President's Club, right? And that's because my sales skills were average. And in fact, you, you wouldn't say they were like below average. Right. But when I started a sales training program, before I ultimately went with you, I had done my research and I researched other people, but I chose mm-hmm. you. And the biggest kind of recognition that I got was my income. So my income levels jumped from like, you know, eighty, ninety thousand dollars uh per year uh to last year making close to four ninety. Um, I want everybody to think about that for a second. So we know a lot about you because you've came in here you went through our sales training courses the last three years and your income just kept going up every year, right? Mm-hmm. But when before you came here, you know, you were making 80, 90 grand a year, which dude in San Francisco, man, hard to get by on 80 or 90 grand. Uh, take taxes out, 401k out, you left crumbs. You're almost homeless in San Francisco, 80, 90. Yeah, I, I actually think the homeless people make more. I mean, <laughs> I know, right? Probably with free stuff, but yeah. you went from within three years of learning the right sales skills. We're not talking about any sales skills, but learning how to communicate to today's consumer. We'll talk about that in a second, but you went from 80 to 90 grand a year to now almost 490,000 that you made in 2019 as a W-2 salesperson. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel ecstatic. It makes me want to like a bit more, to be honest. I'll tell you a little bit of a highlight in that 490 that I made. I had two months in 2019, I made over 100K in commissions. Yeah. And if you annualize that, that's, you know, you're on track to make 1.2, 1.3 million for the entire year. So that's where I want to get you. I mean, where I could make, you know, where I could hit two or three consecutive months of six figures of, of commission, right? So your goal is just change. I mean, I thought I'd be the happiest person on earth if I broke like 300, I would retire, but that's not the way it works, right? You want more. You're always striving for like, how can I get to where you were when you were in your sales career selling yeah. whatever it was? And that's kind of where I am right now. So yeah. never be satisfied. Remember, always be hungry, whatever that phrase is. So that's no, 100%. I, I was in the same shoes. You know, I went from my first or second year, I think I made 150,000. This is all back in 2001. Like I'm an old guy. But I remember like when I got to 350, like a couple years later in one year, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so great. But I, was, I wasn't satisfied. I'm like, yeah. how do I get to 700 now? And then like a couple years later, I made 700 in one year. This is like 2006. And I'm like, okay, how do I go from 700 to like 1.2? That was my main goal. And then the economy crashed in 2008, 2009. And salespeople in my industry, like their incomes were getting chopped in half. Like people were getting fired left and right. The world was coming to an end. Nobody was buying. That's what salespeople said. But my income in 2000, yeah, it was 2008, 2009, because it was kind of like halfway through 2008 that it happened. But in 2009, my income the year before in 2008 was like 740. It jumped all the way to over 1.2 that next year during the Great Recession. Right. Salespeople in my industry were like, what are you doing? This makes no sense. Like our incomes are in half. We're lucky if we have a job. Your income almost doubles. So, and we're going to talk about the opportunity salespeople have with what's going on, right? With the coronavirus and stuff today, because I see a lot of opportunity. So it's, it's all about going from where you're at right now and never being satisfied, right? Like right. once you get to, you know, cause this year you'll probably, I bet you make probably 600 or more or something, but you're, you're not going to be satisfied. You're going to be like, how do I get to 800,000 or how do I get right. to a million, you know? And it's all about learning the right skills that get us to there. What specific steps did you take though, to really get that good at selling? Cause you're like the number one guy down there. You went from just, you said being average or below average to the number one guy. What did your sales manager say? Like, how did you do this or what did he say? So the first thing is I want to tell all your listeners, you know, to get to those types of levels, nobody's going to tell you to do it. You know, you have to want it. You have to innately want it. Wanted. So you have to be, if something's not working, you have to spending your waking hours learning how I could get better. 
I mean, we talked about this, you know, I'm in fitness, you know, I, I research the best personal trainers out there. Yeah. And I then whatever the cost is, I go and I hire them, right? Because you have to really market. So once you have that already kind of programmed in you, mm-hmm. you actually have to go out and do the research, right? Again, like I said, no one's going to give you a million dollars per year. No one's going to say, hey, you know what? Buy my product uh, or I'll sign the agreement, whatever. You have to really want it. Uh, then you got to do your research, right? And so, you know, just like, you know, I ultimately went with you, right? I, I researched Jordan Belfort. I researched Grant Cardone. There's a couple other sales gurus that were out there. And then the one who resonates with you the most, you got to go all in, man. I mean, I started with you with the 21 day sales challenge. Right. Like a basic uh, and it was seven product, bucks. right? Yeah. It was $7, right? And that's right. kind of you know, why I went with it because I'm like, hey, I'm not even making money as a sales guy. I can't afford like thousands of dollars of products. Yeah. But yours was seven dollars, and so I went in, and and every weekend I went into the office and I reviewed the twenty-one day sales challenge. There were like five minute videos. Yeah, every day I probably went through that about ten or fifteen times alone, yeah. and that those are just small clips of what you all you know what you all what you teach. Right, right. And then you just progress, and then you you're, you know, but the coaching system that you have with the level one, level two, all of that. Yeah, you know, they really are able to kind of understand like you know this person really wants to be better. Yeah. So you started with this basic product. Then you got like our kind of our flagship product. It's like a 10 or 12 hour course, Uh a couple thousand bucks for it or whatever. You started getting results, you know, started making a bunch more money. And then you're like, Hey, you reached out to me. I think you messaged me like, how can you train me one-on-one? And I remember starting to training you one-on-one and the growth that you had. But one thing that always impressed me with you compared to maybe some other people that I've seen is that your dedication, like you were dedicated to learn those skills. You didn't just go through the training one time and then that was it. You thought you knew Mm -hmm. everything. You increased your sales the first time you went through it, but you were going through it every day. Like, you know, I would message you on a Friday or something. You're like, or you'd message me. You're like, Hey man, uh, you know, it's 10 o'clock at night. I'm going through the course, this section for an hour and a half on a Friday night while your friends might be going out and having fun, yeah. you were there learning the right skills. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. When I asked you for help and basically yeah. wanted you to take me under my wing yeah. or your wing, like it was in my mind that failure was not an option. Sure. Right? This is the type of, you know, we all strive to be like you, you know, um, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> you know, that was the mindset that yeah. I went in with and sure. I got started learning to do, man. Like I've been doing yeah. Seven figure, seven level, seven level training for three or four yeah. years. Well, yeah. I mean, take a look at your career. Where would you be right now if you had not invested in yourself, got the training to learn the right skills? Where do you think you'd be at right now financially? I would have been just a mediocre sales rep. Not to say there's anything, there's nothing against that, but you know what I was making, maybe making a hundred thousand dollars per year. I would have been severely, severely disappointed in myself because no one taught me skill sets to get better at my book. 100%. That leads me into the next question. Can you share with us maybe two things that our listeners can implement, like starting today, once they hear this train, that's yeah. going to help them get bigger results in sales? Like just two things. What can they implement? Get a mentor, get a coach. And, you know, I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins into a couple of his seminars live, Unleash the Power Within, A Date mm-hmm. with Destiny. And that's one of his mantras too is, You know, whatever the investment is, is get a mentor. I mean, it doesn't even have to be you. It should be somebody who can guide them down the right path to get them the skills that they need, right? So whatever money it is, go find it and hire a mentor to teach you the right skills because no one's going to do it for you. Yeah, because what happens if you don't? Like, you know, the saying is you don't know what you don't know. So if you don't know what your problem is or why you're not making sales, and you keep selling the same way you always have, well, uh-huh. magically, where do you end up going? You Don't get work. the same results. You're right. It's all about finding the right coach or trainer that knows the right skills, that has had the success that you want. You know, I always try to tell that to salespeople. Like, if you want to learn how to make a lot of money in sales, why are you taking sales training from gurus who didn't hardly make that much money when they were actually a salesperson? Right. What skills are they going to give you? If you're saying, I want to make 500000 a year as a salesperson, or if I want to become a millionaire, 
as a sales person, I want to make a million dollars a year. How are you going to do that by taking sales training from somebody who never did that themselves when they were in sales? It makes no sense. Right. Exactly. Why would you go to a personal trainer who's, you know, 40 pounds overweight, right? Or something like that. It's the same concept, right? So yeah. what you have to do is you have to learn the skills that your mentor had learned because they probably went through the same process mm -hmm. back early on in their day. And then learn what trials and tribulations that they went through yeah. to get are right now. You know, I, from listening to you, you would lock yourself in your office yeah. 10 years ago, right? And, you know, and you would listen to the, your questions in, in the car and not listen to Britney Spears. And, you know, I, <laughs> well, you yeah, know. we call it university on wheels, right? When I got into sales, I was 21, broke, burnout college student. This was in 2001, 2002, uh -huh. somewhere in that range. And while all my friends were listening to music, I'd be like, dude, turn that off. We're going to listen to sales training. Like we, if we're going to go out and sell today, because it was a door-to-door -door sales job when I was in college, we need to learn exactly what to say and ask when they open up the door. Who cares about this cool rap song or what Britney Spears is singing? Like how much money is that going to make you? So you make your car a university on wheels. You know, a good mentor of mine, Brian Tracy, taught me that. Um, at one of his, the first events I ever went to as a 21 year old kid is you make your car a university on wheels. So I would oh, yeah. drive back and forth to appointments all day. I'd probably hear two hours of sales training every day. And then in the morning, I'd get up an hour early to study different sales training. So I was learning sales three hours a day, plus what I was learning on the job. Absolutely. When you do that enough with the right skills, you're just bound to have major results. And now's the perfect time. People are stuck at home. So if you go for your evening walks or whatever, you know, you can get your exercise in and listen to a sales training video at the same time, right? Yeah, 100%. So you got to find ways to make learning more efficient, right? Where you're kind of killing two or three birds with one stone if, if time is your problem. If time is 100%. Your what was one thing you really had to change to get to the top as a sales rep? I think it was a mindset of being stubborn. Like, hey, you know, um, I can learn it on my own and I would save all this money if I just spent the time to learn it, learning it on my own. But that just doesn't, it doesn't happen because you're wired in a very certain way of doing things. So it takes 45 days to break a habit or something like that. And so unless you consciously do it day by day by day, then only will you actually change mm -hmm. and and you might even go back into your old ways very easily, even if you have some success, right? But I finally gave in and, you know, said, like, I can't do this on my own because I don't know what to learn. I don't know where to start. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. My sales journey in the very beginning, like my emails, and I would send you uh, my emails in the Voxer, right? And you're like, oh, this is way too long, or like you're over explaining yourself, or you're, you're sounding desperate. Right. But I didn't know any better. I didn't know what a good email looked like because sure. you can't just Google it, right? And it's not like <laughs> right. I had to learn from somebody. Yeah. To, and these are lifelong skills, by the way. I mean, yeah. stuff I learned from you. I mean, I apply it to my relationships. I apply it to lose my luggage at the airport. Yeah. And I, I apply it to when I'm asking to my bank to waive a fee. Yeah. Like it, it's just the way you communicate, right? So you yeah. can apply this. To really any life situation, how do you think salespeople can stand out in a competitive market? Because pretty much anything that anybody sells listening to this, there's always competition. It's not like you're the only person in cybersecurity, right? Uh -huh. How do salespeople stand out in the market? So I think it goes back to how you teach. One is, you know, get the right questions. Guys, I went to a show in San Francisco two months ago. And this is a show where there's literally like different exhibit booths, halls in Moscone Center, which is huge. And there are literally 2,000 companies, startups, um, public companies, and so forth, yeah. that have the same buzzwords on the thing, machine learning, artificial intelligence, whatever. Right. And if I was someone who didn't really know, you know what I wanted or whatever, none of these boots stood out, right? right. Because of the same thing, right? Yeah. And this is why I view like salespeople. It's what you share in one of your videos. It's like when you do the cold call, hi, my name is who we are with, I do. Yeah. So to break that mold, you actually need to change your approach. Right? So sure. you need to learn the right communication skills and the right questions. That's one thing. The other thing is like you need to be knowledgeable. You need to be reading, you know, every day around like what is going on in the industry. So if you sell houses or you're in real estate, you know, telling you about the housing market that are telling you about what homes got bought at what price, are telling you about like how the Fed's decision on interest rates is going to affect like buyers on mortgage. You need to be educated on that. A little bit of work, yeah. right? 
could set you apart from like the other real estate agent who just wants to like sell a house and doesn't really know anything about the market or anything about you. I think you hit it right on the head. To stand out, you have to become what we call a trusted authority. Now, you don't become a trusted authority just by showing up or calling a prospect or, you know, talking to them about how great the weather is or who won the local football game or taking them on a golf trip because every salesperson does that. That does not make you stand out. It doesn't matter what you sell. You only stand out by learning the right questions to ask at the right time in the conversation that make your potential customer really think deeply about what you're asking. Because when your tonality is too fast and you're talking too fast, you sound like a salesperson who's there to sell them something. So the biggest thing you want to do is don't act like a salesperson. Somebody says, Shri, you're, you're such a great salesperson or you can sell anything to anybody. If one of your prospects says that, that's like the kiss of death, right? Because if you have somebody that says that to you, that means they think you're trying to sell them something. They feel that they're being sold. And how many of those people that have ever told you you're a great salesperson ever bought from you? None. None. They don't. Okay. So that is something that as our listeners, if you're a listener right now, you never want to hear that. Okay. You want to come across, instead of coming across as somebody who's there to, you know, sell them something so you can make money, you want to come across as somebody who's there to find out if you can actually help them to actually solve problems or challenges they have. When they feel that you're only there for them, they will open up to you and you don't become commoditized. So many salespeople, 97% of salespeople selling anything become commoditized. They show up, they ask a few logical based questions. uh, Hey, John, what keeps you awake at night? Boring. That's such an overused consultative question. When you ask it, it just triggers people to put up their wall because they know what you're doing. So they ask these logical based questions, two or three of them. And then what do they do? They go into their pitch talking about their features and benefits and how they have the best this and the best to that. And which by the way, every salesperson says they're the best, right? Because what salesperson that's ever sold you anything said, oh yeah, my product's fifth best in the market. No, everybody says they have the best product. So to a prospect that goes in one ear out the other. Right. So if you're coming across that way, realize your prospect is automatically going to put up the sales resistance wall. And you're going to have to compete with that the whole time you're talking to them. Uh So when you ask the right questions at the right time, we talk about becoming a problem finder. It helps the prospect uncover challenges and problems in their mind that they might not have even thought they had because, or maybe they didn't know the problem was so bad or that it could be bad in the future if they don't do anything. Because without helping them uncover that in their own mind, for them to want to do something about it, it's impossible for them to ever buy from you So you can actually solve their problem. Absolutely. And what makes things worse is if you have like a 30 slide PowerPoint that you're pushing down in technology, that's very common, a slide deck that is just bullet points and all of that, you know, you're reading off of it and you're just going through the deck slide by slide. You've lost them the first five minutes. Oh, they're done. Yeah. You're automatically become commoditized and they'll just shop you around based on price at that point. You are commoditized. You have no control of that sale happening or not happening. You literally have no control. What do you think is the most pervasive issue right now in sales? Your thoughts? I think it goes back to the basics. I think it's talking about your product. I think it's, um, well, there's two things. One is the the excitement of the persona. And the second thing is that you're talking about your solution way too quickly in that conversation. I'm a senior guy on my team, so I critique sales calls of kind of more junior people. Yeah. They within the first three minutes, they're already talking about their product. Yeah, what happens when they do? Oh, no, you could hear like pin drops because people are like, you know, like, do you have any questions, right? And you've said some really useful stuff because your product is good, right? And, you know, you hear like there's a group of like five executives on the other side of the phone. No, no, we're good. No, we're good. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're ready to move on. I'm like, really? I'm like, you just said something that no one else in your industry has can solve. And the execs that you're pitching to have no questions around that. 
they just move on. They talk, they go to the next slide. They just disappear, right? Because yeah. there's there's two things that happen. So as, as human beings, when we feel like we're being sold to, we react in one of two ways. We either, we have a really A-type personality. We might actually be aggressive back, throw out objections and just completely reject what the salesperson's offering. Or we either withdraw from them, just like those executives. Oh, that sounds good. You know, leave me some information. We'll get back to you. Maybe call me back in a week or a month, a year later. The salesperson calls them back. They don't answer the call. They don't return the call. They don't return an email. They completely ghost you. And they go into what I call witness protection mode, withdrawal Mm -hmm. mode. So that's what happens when you introduce your solution too early in the conversation. You know, what do most salespeople do? Most salespeople are what I call product pushers. They ask a few logical-based questions, and then like you said, they go into their solution. They talk about the features and benefits and how they have the best this and the best that, and they downplay their competition. And that's like taking a bucket of mud, like throwing it up against the wall, hoping and praying that something we're gonna say is gonna magically get them to wanna buy from us. Absolutely. Um, I call that hopium. It's the drug. Yeah. You've heard me say that. It's the drug that so many salespeople are on where they have no control. They mm-hmm. hope and pray that the person's going to buy. And that's such a hard and unpredictable way to make an income. Because they haven't asked the right questions. Yeah. I want to add one more thing to the pervasive of this thing. And, you know, it's stuff that I see when I get cold emails, uh, not so much cold calls, you know, but, but never keep your emails so low key. You know, your emails shouldn't be filled with exclamation points, bold phrases, italicized stuff, several bullet points, right? Because to me, that screams like, oh my God, like, I need to catch your attention and I need to bold something or I need to add two exclamation marks or something. You don't see, if a doctor were to write to you, he's like, yeah, I think you should take Xantax. And he doesn't like bold the word Xantax. He doesn't act like he's needy. Exactly, because he's the expert, right? And so he has that kind of, you know, uh, mindset like, hey, look, I'm giving you opinion from an expert authority. You do what you want to do with it, but I'm just telling you as an expert, this is what I recommend. Right. And well, remember, you were in my one on one training program for a year. And I remember a couple, of, well, several times, especially in the first couple of months, you're like, hey, check out this email. And it'd be like this two or three paragraph email that you would yeah. send to somebody. Like if they didn't return your phone call or didn't return an email, you would email them like a three page thing or like a, not a page, but like a three paragraph thing. I'm like, dude, no, no, no. Get all that out. And what did I say? I said, here's what you type them. Hey, John, tried to reach you the other day, did not hear back from you. Dot, right. dot, 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 dot. Then scroll down two lines. How did you want to proceed from here? Question mark. Exactly. And then hit send. And then what did people started doing once you would send it that way? They would reply back. I would like rehash the entire benefits of my product. Like as we discussed, our product is blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And it would just get lost in the twilight zone, right? And I'm like, show me what am I doing wrong? But that's exactly my point, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're listening to this right now and you, let's say you had a conversation, they were supposed to call you back or whatever. You called them, left a message and answer. Here's what you say in email. Hey, Amy, tried to reach you the other day, comma, did not hear back from you, dot, 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 dot. Then scroll down two lines. How did you want to proceed from here? Question mark. That's it. Don't say sincerely. Don't say all the best or I hope you're having a great day. That's it. It has a psychological effect too. It, the effect, the psychological effect that it leaves is like, hey, you're not going to be hearing from me if you're not interested because, you know, there's part of, there's value in this product for you, not for me, yeah. right? So when they, when they have that feeling like this person's going to go, it's like dating, right? When, when someone says, I'm done, you know, like, I don't want to waste my time anymore. Like, what? wait, wait, not yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Sorry, you know, I was sick and all that. It's the same thing. It's a psychological trigger that those words have on that process. You're working with human behavior, whereas yeah. most salespeople use sales skills that I hate to say this because they're so old school. You know, they're from like boiler room days of selling or consultative selling for 30 years ago. The consumers heard so many times that they keep using these skills. And I hate to say this, but they're losing sales they could be making, right? Right. They're skills that don't work with human behavior. And then there's skills like we teach that actually work with human behavior. 
So you have human behavior on your side rather than you working against it, right? So we all know what's going on right now, the coronavirus. You know, we don't know how long it's going to take for us to get out of it here. I think it's coming in on the right end here pretty soon. But what are you doing right now with, with all this going on? Are you, you know, are you sitting around watching Netflix all day and sucking your thumb, hoping it's going to get better? Or are you, what are you doing with your time? I've adapted, right? And so, you know, I I used to be a gym rat. So the first thing I've done is I turned my balcony into a gym, right? I bought about $1,000 of equipment on Amazon. I have bands and I have a weighted vest and all that because that's something where like I got to do it to kind of, you know, uh, start my day. But from a career perspective, you know, I'll be honest with you, a lot of my um, prospecting, the replies back have kind of taken, you know, slowed down a bit, but I'm keeping up with the training where I used to do the, the eight week academy. This is that 14 hour program that you have like once a month. Now I do it about two, three times a month. So I go through the academy about like every four days or so. And yeah. I take a break and then I'm on the, you know, your one-on-one role play on Tuesday. Right. Um, I, I have the, you know, I, I take, I, you know, I've written down questions from the academy. I've filled up like two or three notepads, but it, it's just something, you know, when we get out of this and we will yeah, you know, of course. get out of this, right. You know, you're going to be left in two states. You're going to be left in either an advanced state that you're better, or you're going to be left in a, a, a kind of defeated state where you've gained a lot of weight, you're depressed, and you let your sales skills kind of slide. And now you're behind the curve when like the economy. Oh, you're behind the curve. And I hate to tell you guys this, but when you get out of here, it's going to be a little bit more harder to sell because people are going to be a little bit more cautious. They're going to be a little bit more skeptical about what right. will happen. They might be hold on to money more. So if you're still using old school techniques and talking about your solution shortly in the conversation and just asking a few generic surface level questions and then jumping into your pitch, you are really going to struggle 100%. Even when the economy comes back, because people are going to be even more skeptical and more cautious than they were before. So I once know. you learn the right skills, once you learn the right questions, once you learn when and how to ask them with the right tonality, you will set yourself apart from every single salesperson in your company, 100% Absolutely. in your industry. Absolutely. Yep. What type of results? You know, we talked about your income that you made 2019. You made 400, almost 490,000 commission from your W-2 job. But because of that, I think you were, you went and got a, another, a, even a better job, right? Like you even got, you got a That's better right. opportunity yeah. so I mean, the money you made. Tell us a little so bit about what happened. So I started a new job in about a week. And so that's why I'm not doing too much prospecting these days because, yeah. you know, I'm, I got, I'm out of here in a week. So I'm not going to close really anything in the next like five or six days. But the new job is definitely a step up where, you know, I live in Silicon Valley and, you know, the, the carrot in Silicon Valley are the, the stock options, right? Because of my success that I had when I, at my current company before it got acquired, the CEO of that company, right? Who sold, he, this is his fourth or fifth exit, a very seasoned entrepreneur. He is on the board of directors of this new company that I'm joining. And he went to the CEO. He's like, I have a great sales guy for you. Mm-hmm. you hire him. You should take a look at him. And that's, that's how I got the job. And think about this three years ago, so, yeah. before you went through the training, like you said, you're just an average salesperson. They probably didn't even know who you were. And well, then within th- a couple of years, you went from like average to like the number one person. Right. That's incredible. Right. Exactly. And so think about it as like the network effect where like, you know, the CEO of my old company is now on the board of a new company. He tells the CEO of the new company, you need to hire this guy because he's a great sales guy. Like, think about, like, it would not have happened if I, if I didn't want to improve myself. Think about opportunities that come to you when you are making that type of income as a salesperson. You learn those type of skills. That didn't right. just come because you worked more hours or you made more cold calls. That came because the people you talked to, you converted much more of them into sales. Absolutely, right? Yeah. Uh, so, I'm very excited it, I never thought I would start a new job quarantined with my new laptop being shipped at home. And I got <laughs> right. even, but I guess I don't know. It is what it is, right? It's, yeah. uh, what do you think the difference is in selling in our day compared to even 10 to 20 years ago? How is it different? I think you nailed it early on you know, when I first began your training. I think it's the access to information, right? That mm-hmm. people have been, you know, with, with the internet and with, you know, Yelp and all these other websites, you know, people actually get educated on a product without having an intermediary. Yep. Um, so back in the day, we didn't have that. The salesperson was essential into the process. 
yeah. to think about so much, right? Um, people buy cars online, right? They don't even need the car salesman anymore, right? They know what they want. Um, so the way you keep yourself relevant in this situation yeah. is, you know, what we discussed about is being able to help your prospect see problems that they don't know that they have. Yeah. Right. Hundred um, percent. Yeah, because I mean, twenty plus years ago, you know, the, the salesperson consumers relied on the salesperson to educate them like mm-hmm. they did right they would right. send out the salesperson company sends out a salesperson to educate about their products and services and besides tv and radio maybe newspaper that's really the primary way the consumer would learn about what you're offering with the era that we live in today the rise of technology the ease of the internet especially social media completely changed even in the last seven eight years it's completely changed right you know, consumers know all about your company they know about your products as your services. They know your pricing. They know who your competitors are. They know how long you're in business. They know everything about you by simply doing a Google search on their phone. Mm-hmm. And because of that newfound power, they're no longer going to be manipulated or pressured by pushy salespeople that's trying to stuff their solution down their throat because they know they've got a lot of other options to choose the exact product or service that you sell. Absolutely. You know, so that's, you know, they don't want to be pestered. They don't want to be bothered or annoyed. They're busy. And salespeople already have a bad reputation as it is, right? And why is that? Why do you think salespeople in general have a bad reputation? Because they have been hounded, like CTOs, CIOs, they've been hounded with salespeople calling them, not knowing a damn thing about their business and telling them, oh, they should buy this and they should buy that. And then yeah. You just don't have enough time. Well, it's, it's something that I have really a pet peeve when salespeople say, oh, buyers are liars. It's such a big deep to me because I'm like, you know what? They're only lying because of what? Because of the way you're communicating to them. Absolutely. They don't trust you and they don't open up to you. It's the salesperson's fault. Until we understand that the reason why I'm not selling the way I should be or getting the results I'm getting is not because of my consumers are all broke or this or that. It's because you don't know how to communicate them to cause them to motivate themselves to go out and find the funds to purchase what you're off. Buyers are not liars. They're only lying to you because of the way you've been taught how to communicate to them. Once Absolutely. you change that, once you learn the right questions to ask at the right time in the conversation that work with human behavior, that get the prospect to want to open up to you, right. want to tell you the truth, uh-huh. you're going to really struggle in sales. But you don't have to. There's good news. You don't have to keep struggling. Like Sheree here, once he learned the right skills, he went from 80 grand a year to last year, 400 and almost 90,000 in one freaking year. That's a, you five times your income. The goal is to hit seven in the next year or two years. That's my, that's my goal. Congratulations. Why do you think most sales are lost? Something we just kind of talked about it, but why do you think most sales are lost by the sales person? Why do you think that is? I don't think they ask the right question. They don't ask for the right commitment. You might have a great introductory call. We call it discovery. But when that call ends, enough questions haven't been asked to kind of pique the curiosity of the prospect saying, oh, I might have a real problem on my hands. What do you do in your sales process to make sure that doesn't happen to you? Well, I ask the right questions, the the questions that you teach, right? But then, you know, like you said, you always have to get the commitment when you have one call to kind of set up the next call, right? So it's like, you know, would it be appropriate for us to send you this or to schedule another type of talk? So that's, that's very important because if that's not asked, there's nothing, there's no, there's nothing to talk about. Yeah. And you're more, you're in a complex selling environment, right? Like you're selling. Oh yeah. My sales cycle is going like nine months, 12 months. To banks, right? You're not in a three-day sales cycle or, you know, oh, you're in or you're out type of sales cycle. I mean, that doesn't work obviously in B2B sales or complex sales. So your wording is very important when you get off that first call. It's not saying, hey, I'm so excited about what we're offering. Uh, When are you ready to sign up? Or I'm so excited. Uh, Why don't we do another call Tuesday at four or Wednesday at five? Which one do you want to do? Because if you did that, what would they say? Uh, they're like, oh, yeah, we'll think about it. Or, you know, they'll uh, say, we'll get back to you. And obviously, you know, what happens? Done. You're yeah, done. You're, you're right? get in the water. Like, you don't, they don't get back to you. What would be a typical question you use at the end of that first call 
to schedule exactly, that. Exactly what you teach. I've enjoyed our conversation. Would it be appropriate to schedule something to see if, there, or would it be appropriate to schedule a demo of our product to see if what we're doing would kind of fit into what you're looking for? And what do they do when you ask that? You know, it's funny because the way you've taught students to ask that question, it's almost impossible for them to say no. <laughs> exactly. It's, 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 it's like a, it's a mind trick, right? Because the way the question's asked, it gives them the option to back out if they want, right? But because of how it's asked, they're always almost 99% of the time open to like... work Because it, it works with human behavior, right? It does. So if I, you know, John, I enjoyed our conversation. Tell me, would it make sense for us to schedule a demo to go over, you know, X, Y, Z to see if we can actually help you solve some of these challenges? Would that be appropriate? Right. You ask that question, it's not like I'm going to be like, nope, that would not be appropriate. Exactly. No. You can't yeah. say no to that. You can't say no to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thanks so much for being on the show today. I know that last one's really going to help our listeners. Any, any last words of advice for our listeners? If you have a desire to be better you know, at your profession, if you have a desire to make more money for you and your family or just whatever, right, really seek the right coaching, the right mentorship to get there. Because if you don't, you're going to, like you said, you're going to probably have the same income and the same title that you have been, that you've had for the next God knows how many years. And if we go through something like this again, which we will, like this pandemic, the people who are going to be let go, the people who are going to be let, laid off are the people who are not performing. I mean, that's just the way, like a CEO. It's the way it goes. Yeah, it's the way it goes. And salespeople, in fact, get asked first than like people in engineering or in product because those are essential units of a business to survive. Sales, not so much. And so really, really do what it takes to be good uh, because um, you'll just be more fulfilled and happier at the end of the day. And that's all. You and you'll have ultimate job security because if you're the top salesperson in the company, well, and one of the top in the, in the industry you're in, I hate to tell you, you're not going anywhere unless you want to. They're not going to let you. You're making them millions of dollars a year. Why would they ever? You'd be the last one to go and they'd be shutting the doors like out of business at that point. I know, I know. I mean, you're going to have 50 other opportunities that can pay you that much or more. That's exactly right. You know, I'm going to a new company in a week, but the company I'm with right now, they give me a $50,000 retention. I just got to stay here for three more months and I basically get a $50,000 retention deposited in my bank account, right? And so if you're good, the company will fight for you to keep you. 100%. Congratulations, man. That's amazing. Thank you, man. Well, thanks for being on the show. Probably have you on here again, you know, maybe a year or two down the road once you, you know, maybe next year once you hit seven figures a year in commissions, I'm going to have you back on. All right, man. Thanks to everybody for being on. Uh, take Shree's advice 100%. He's a salesperson that went from 80000 a year, a couple of years later, making almost 500000 selling the same thing, almost made 500,000 just last year in straight commission, selling the exact product or service he was selling a couple years before that, making 80,000 a year. If he can do it, you can do it, we can all do it. Take his advice. Uh, remember, if you're still using closing skills that are so outdated, if you're using sales skills that are outdated, that do not work with human behavior, that are from the dinosaur ages of selling, you are losing sales. Closers are losers. You're losing sales that you could be making with the right skills. So with that, thanks for being on, Shree. We look forward to having you back Thank sometime. You. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Now, if you're serious about joining the top 1%, I mean the top 1%, and you want to experience more training content just like this, click the links right over there right over there, they're exactly what you need to see next. You see, I release new episodes featuring top salespeople and sales authorities, multiple six-figure, high six-figure, even seven-figure earners. And if you're new here, do yourself a favor and smash that subscribe button right below, right below, and join our new Facebook group, Sales Revolution. You see, it's free, and there's a link in the description below just for you, we put it there for you. Finally, I make posts on Facebook and Instagram each and every day with more tips and training. So be sure and follow me and turn on your notifications. So make a comment in the first seven minutes to any of my latest posts, share this episode, and there's a very real chance that you're gonna win some killer prizes. 
And here's the thing, don't sit on the sidelines. Don't be like everyone else. Get into the game. Join the sales revolution. Stay active, get involved, learn the right skills, and we will show you how to take your life and income to a level that most only dream about.